Okay, so I'm going to be talking, as the title says, um, about dynamo action and convection. Okay, so it's going to be a slightly different sort of thing to what we had this morning. Um, and this is this is work that I've been doing for a number of years um, with Pastor Tanya in Chicago and recently with Mike Proctor. Okay, so we heard this morning from Ryan Beck about the large-scale dynamos, and that's really what, what I'm going to be interested in. Um, how to get a large-scale dynamo. Um, I don't think now that there's too much debate about how you can get a dynamo, something that amplifies magnetic fields. Just about anything amplifies a magnetic field, provided it's super messy, and provided the magnetic Reynolds number is high enough. And the problem... Um, in astrophysics, for sure, is how to explain coherent large-scale fields. Um, quite what we mean by a large-scale dynamo, well, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Roughly speaking, something that has some kind of significant component on scales large compared to the, the driving scale. Okay. And... Uh, the sun, of course, seems to manage this without too much problem, and we saw this morning examples of large-scale fields on scales much, much bigger than that, you know, in galactic fields. So, so in nature, it seems that there's not too much difficulty in getting a large-scale field. My own feeling is that if we didn't have nature, then from theoretical grounds, I'd be pretty convinced that they couldn't exist. But, Nature manages it with, with no problem whatsoever. So what do we mean by a large-scale dynamo? That if you had a small enough box, say, suppose you were doing a computation, if you had a small box, it wasn't a dynamo. Okay? But if you made the box big enough, then you got a dynamo. Okay? So I'm, that clearly is, is a large-scale dynamo. And I'm talking about, you know, you'd need a box that was big compared to um, the typical eddy size, say, if you're doing a turbulent simulation. So what we would like, and this is one way of approaching large-scale dynamos, is to look at small boxes. Okay. Um, and calculate things that we, that we know and love, like alpha and beta. And you can imagine that you might have a small box of helical turbulence, and you go in there, and by whatever means you impose a field or a field gradient, you calculate alpha and beta. Okay. Then, if the domain is then large enough, so, and you might not have a dynamo, you don't need a dynamo to have mean, you, you can have mean induction, of course, without a dynamo. So suppose that you have a box, and you go in and you calculate alpha and beta, then what you'd like to say is that if the box were big enough, then you, you get a, a growth rate roughly like alpha k minus beta k squared. Okay. And that picture makes good sense in certain circumstances. It makes sense if, um, if there is no dynamo in the box that you're looking at. Okay. And it also makes sense provided that when you go to a big box, it looks something like the small box. If you measure something on the small box and then the big box looks nothing like it, then it's, again, you might be in some kind of trouble. But the real, well, one of the real questions, especially, of course, astrophysically, is what happens at I of it? Okay. It's okay to say, here's a, I, I have a small box of turbulence, I measure it, there's no dynamo, I work out alpha and beta, everything's fine. But typically, that's not the case. Okay. Typically, at high enough Rm, any flow is a dynamo. Any messy three-dimensional flow is a dynamo. Okay? So the question is, what has that got to do with anything? What's that got to do with mean field theory? So those are kind of um, very waffly sort of points that one might consider. So I'm going to talk about how we could explore some of these <coughs> excuse me, ideas through a really simple conceptually simple problem, this almost the simplest dynamo problem you can do, which is um, rotating turbulent convection. Rotating because we're, you know, we're, we're interested in large-scale dynamos, so you think a 
about eliciting them. Rotation is a good way of getting it. So here's some points we could address, um, and some problems that might arise. We've heard lots of problems today already. Um, there's a few more. Difficulties in actually calculating the mean induction. I said, oh, well, you've got a small box of turbulence or whatever, it's not a dynamo. You go in and measure alpha. That, that sounds easy. Okay, and we'll see that it's... There are certain difficulties in calculating alpha even when there's no dynamo. Then there's what I think is the most crucial issue, which is what's the relation between a manifestly non-large-scale dynamo by which I mean a dynamo driven by a non-helical, non-reflectionally symmetric flow. No, reflectionally symmetric flow. Um, and what I've called here the related helical case. Okay. In, so in, a turbulent, in this problem, what's the relation between the dynamo driven by non-rotating convection and rotating convection? And finally, can we, looking ahead, I'm going to say that there's a bit of a problem here, can we be helped by adding by large-scale shear. Okay, so I hope to address these. Um, so as I say, the problem is really simple in some sense. Um, it goes back to the model studied by Soward and Childress and Soward way back in the 70s, early 70s. It's this, it's Boussinesque and it's rotating about the pole and, and that's it. So it has a few um, numbers few dimensional, dimensionless quantities to define the problem. I'm going to talk about a fixed Taylor number, which is a measure of the rotation, a fixed Prandtl number, a fixed magnetic Prandtl number, and I'm going to vary two things really. One is the Rayleigh number, controlling the bigger of the convection, and the other is the size of the box. Okay. Um, so it's periodic in, in the horizontal, but the, the size of the domain of periodicity compared to the, to the vertical. Okay. Given that you fix these, I mean, the, the numbers themselves don't matter, but there are these two crucial numbers. One is the onset of convection, one is the onset of dynamo action. So you can see that there is a regime here where um, you can have convection, even quite turbulent, messy convection, but not a dynamo. Uh, David, uh, yes. this is dynamo action you mean small scale dynamo? I mean dynamo action of any shape or form. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So it's Poussin-esque, so you know, everything is um, symmetric or anti-symmetric about the mid-plane. So you have to do half box averages. So the Poussin-esque convection, the, the mean EMFs. So by a mean field for this problem, I mean a horizontal field. Okay. But you have to take averages about the midplane. So you can think of this, if you like, as a model of the whole sun. The top half is the northern hemisphere, the bottom half is the southern hemisphere. The sun, of course, has no mean field in that sense. So we're interested in um, averages over, it doesn't matter which half, over one half of the domain. Okay. So this is what you might do. You take a small box, and uh, it's not a dynamo, it's not even very exciting convection, but you go in and you measure an EMF. So you plonk a field across the, you put in a horizontal field, you calculate E, and hence you calculate alpha, and you find there's an alpha. And again, the number doesn't matter, except that it's a reasonable number. This is the, uh, this is the velocity, the... Uh, yeah, the R, that's the velocity square. The RMS velocity is the square root of that, which is about 18, and so this is, a, you know, it's a sensible number. It's about half of the RMS velocity. Okay. So if we were in a best of all possible worlds, we'd say, oh, we've got alpha, we could do beta in a similar way, and, and we've solved the problem. Okay? Because alpha and beta are good things to have. So the philosophy, at least this is how I read the philosophy of mean field theory, is that you do some kind of small numerical simulations of that ilk, and then you calculate alpha and beta, and then you hope to say something about the dynamo on a large scale from those. Okay. And I guess what I'm going to say is that 
that there are problems. Okay. So this is one problem, which is that the small box doesn't look like the large box. Okay. You can see these are three values of the Rayleigh number. Um, so neither of these two are dynamo, and this one is. Um, and this was the one we just looked at. So if you were to use that as a kind of proxy for what happens here, you might be in trouble. Okay, so there is immediately an issue of how small a small box needs to be before it's a true representation of the large box. Okay. And there are, but there are other more well, equally serious issues. So let's just have a look at what happens at three values of the Rayleigh number. So this is marginal, com slightly, no, no, slightly supercritical convection, more supercritical but not a dynamo, and a dynamo. Okay, and this is this is the helicity. So all being all other things, you know, from what we from what we know about mean field theory, what we what we the kind of ideas that we hold dear are that if you've got a helical flow, and as I say, it's, it's anti-symmetric. Okay, so we're considering half of this. This is quite helical. Okay. Of course, as the convection is increased, it gets less helical because you, you're putting energy into the convection against the rotation, but it's still reasonably helical. It's got a relative helicity of 0.3. You might think, we might think, that that will work well as a, as a mean field dynamo. Okay. Um, so these, and of course we could do the problem. We, could, we don't need mean field theory. We could just go in and see what the answer is. So in a minute we'll go in and see what the answer is. But this, is, this shows the difficulties in calculating the EMF in this problem. Okay, so these are half box averages of the EMF at three different values of the Rayleigh number. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, in these three cases, mm -hmm. do you observe measure granular structure? No, no. Not, no. no. Just small really. scale. Yeah, I think there's a difference. Yeah, and that's a good point. But I think there's a difference between rotating convection and non-rotating convection in the in in how it moves to larger scales. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, what can you say? It's massively fluctuating. Okay. And that if you didn't. If you didn't go for a long period of time, you could easily get the wrong answer, whatever the answer is. Okay, I mean, we said that there is an answer. Okay. It's a little worrying in that each of these points in time is an average over a lot of cells. Okay. Mean field theory says that you average over something. This is an average over the box, and the box has a lot of cells. So, but, but a spatial average doesn't hit the nail on the head remotely, okay? You still have to do a temporal average of all of this mess, okay, over a long time. So to actually pin down an answer for alpha, you have to do quite a big simulation, integrate it over a lot of time to give you an answer, okay? Then you wonder what that answer means, having done all of that. So, that, so those were... This is a cumulative time average now. So these are the averages of that previous thing. So you can see that there is an answer, at least. Okay. But it's a very different answer. This is a small box. No, sorry, this is a big box. R8 was 80,000. Alpha is about 1, because this is 0.1 and this is 0.1. It's, but remember, alpha was 8.5 before, so the small box is not a very good representation of the large box. But there is an answer. Here, I guess there's an answer. At least there's a sign. And here, I wouldn't like to put money even on what the sign of alpha is. Okay, so here we have a turbulent, highly turbulent mess, for which alpha, at least over this quite long period of time, is essentially not, uh, not we can't determine it. Okay. <coughs> Whereas in the small box, okay, um, we can, this is the answer we had before, this is um, 150,000, and this is a mess. You still can't determine. Um, you still can't determine what's going on at 500,000 in a small box. Okay. 
So if you bought into the theory of the, the mean field philosophy, you would say, well, okay, here's an answer. This tells me alpha, I could get beta, and that tells me something about the large scale dynamo. But actually, it doesn't. Okay. Excuse me, please. Mm. In what unit do you measure your, your guys in this population? Um, everything is everything is scaled with the thermal time. Thermal? Yeah, it's the usual scaling in convention. You scale times with d squared over kappa. But Prandtl numbers are unity, both thermal the, and magnetic. The, that's what the, um, the Prandtl number is, is one, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the magnetic Prandtl number is five, yeah. Okay, I'm being urged to uh, hurry up. Oh, no, I, mean, I should hurry up. <laughs> 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 um, right. So that's, me, that's what we might get if we liked alpha and beta, okay. But we, you know, now computers are big enough, we don't actually have to get alpha and beta, we just go in and do the problem. Okay, so here we come along and we do the problem. So here's a big box. Um, actually, this is now an even bigger rating number, a million. And we do two, we do a comparison, sorry. Uh, wrong way. Um, we're going to compare these two cases, non-rotating case with a lower rating number and a rotating case with a higher rating number and that Taylor number. They've got roughly the same Reynolds number and that's why, we, that's why they're chosen. And these are what the, this is what the dynamo looks like for those two cases. Okay, not very different. This is the non-rotating. This is the rotating. So from that from that slide, precious little difference. Okay, but of course what we really want to know is is there a is there a difference in the structure? Can you get a large scale? You know maybe this. <coughs> I think what we would like is for this thing to be peaked on the on the scale of the of the driving, and this thing possibly to have a, a kind of migration towards larger scales. Um, and this is the answer. Well, this is the answer over here. These are the velocity spectra. Um, so this kind of answers um, Eagle's point a little. The the non-rotating one has a tendency to, to move to larger scales. The rotating one keeps it at smaller velocity scales. But there is, there is very little difference in these two dynamos, even though one is rotating and one is not. One has quite a lot of helicity and one does not. Okay. I'll come back. Well, I'll say a little bit at the end. So, I mean, my own view is that that's a bit worrying. Because all we're seeing, all we're seeing in this calculation, I reckon, is a modification to what you would get in the absence, in the complete absence of rotation. There is no tendency to build up a large scale field. But it has the ingredients, it has alpha, it has elicity, I should say. Uh, if you consider the loss of the field, mm. this is homogeneous field. Or no, non uniform um, No, it's homogeneous. I mean, homogeneous? It, yeah. Okay. So, a question you can ask, of course, is oh, we seem to be in a bit of a hole. Can we get out of it? And everyone always says, whenever I give this talk in a kind of negative manner that I'm kind of giving it in now, they will say, oh, you could get out of it if you put in some shear. That's not actually getting out of it, because it should have worked anyway. But you think, well, I astrophysical objects have shear. Let's do it. So, so uh, Mike and I have been looking at this. Um, and there's various things one can do. You can drive the shear. You can hardwire the shear by just going into your equation and plunking in the velocity, which is probably the most artificial of the three, or you can tilt your convection, which will also drive a shear. So we've looked at number one, because in, they all have pluses and minuses, but this one, yeah, you have to introduce an external force, but you've got some kind of measure of, of what you're doing, you can vary it. Um, so we have... So we've taken the rotating convection and we've driven the shear in the horizontal of this form. That's the target shear, if you like. And, you can see, and this is what you get. 
you never get the target shear once you have convection. Convection eats up the shear like nobody's business. You have to drive it much harder than you would otherwise. Um, if I turned off the convection, I get a really massive shear flow. Okay. So um, you have to drive it harder in some sense. Okay. But it's at your control. So we're just taking what we had before, and now we're introducing a big, a large scale shear, just one mode in the whole horizontal, in a box which is um, 10 by 10 by 1. Okay. So this is a bit like I've already shown. This is what happens with no shear. Um, okay, slightly different parameters to the one I've shown, but it's, this, is, this is like the case I've shown with rotation. I mean, this has rotation. Okay. So this is um, the equivalent dynamo action with, um, with a force shear. Okay. So this is the amount of energy in the driven mode. It's quite a lot. It's of the order of 40%, 30 to 40%. But the actual... So the question is, what's the difference in the dynamo? It's a jolly, jolly good dynamo, just as the other one was. In fact, in terms of its um, growth rate and in terms of its saturation level, it's very similar, right? These are, this is the exponential growth and saturation of a dynamo with and without the velocity shear. They grow at essentially the same rate and they saturate at essentially the same value. You say, ah, oh, yeah, but they must be different somewhere. Um, since I'm running out of time, let me show you the, the crucial one. So this is... Um, this is what the velocity spectra look like. They really are forced. They have a jolly good shear, right? I mean, this is all, this is the shear mode, and this is kind of the other mode. This is in the kinematic regime, this is in the dynamic regime. Okay? There's not much difference between them. Whether the dynamo is saturated or not, uh, on the term, in terms of the velocity spectrum. <coughs> but there is a big driven mode. Okay. This is a strong shear in comparison with the correlation time of the velocity field. Have you tried to change shear? No. The Sorry, change shear? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, you change shear. No, no, sorry, I didn't catch your question. Okay, uh, this is simulations for one given value of shear. This is, yes. Yeah. We have changed the shear, but oh, okay. this, is the, this is the most we've had. Okay. This is the biggest shear we've had, which is about getting up to half, well, about 40% of the energy, of all the energy, all the kinetic energy is in the starch scale mode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So without any, sorry, I should go back, without any shear, this is what the magnetic field looks like. We've seen this one before. It's, it's peaked here, which is, you know, and, and falls off towards large scales. And if we... Okay, but this is the magnetic. These are the magnetic spectra with shear. So these are the magnetic spectra, which result from velocity spectra, which look like that. So they have a they have a great shear in velocity. Okay, and if all that we cling to makes sense, then we have a big omega effect. Everything is there for an omega. And yet, there's no, it's not putting the energy into the, into the magnetic field. My feeling is that it's not putting the energy into the, it's not generating a coherent large scale field because the, small, the stuff that it's trying to shear is such a mess that it's, no, it's got nothing to grab onto to pull it into something sensible. So even when you force the problem like this to, to have this nice velocity shear, um, you still struggle you still struggle to get a large-scale magnetic field. Okay, let me just... So here's my conclusions. This, right. I mean, the bottom line is that we fail to get a, a large-scale dynamo. There's plenty of... There's plenty of induction. There isn't mu much mean induction. We reckon it's, it's kind of painful even to calculate alpha. We saw those problems in... I said you had to integrate over time. We worked out, roughly, how big a domain you'd need to uh, pin it down in one go. And that's the domain. That's not the resolution, that's the domain. Okay. 
<coughs> which is fast. Um, there's a good dynamo, as we all know, there's no problem with dynamo, but there's no evidence of large scale dynamo. And this is what, after much messing around with all of this, this is what I think, this is what worries me most. Okay. The alpha and beta are not particularly relevant to this problem. What we're seeing is the modification to a small scale dynamo. And that you might calculate alpha and you might calculate beta and they predict something but you never see that something you see the other thing because the other thing is a small scale dynamo the small scale dynamo is there and it's modified by rotation but what you predict in terms of alpha and beta I don't think you actually see and I think that's a generic problem at high magnetic Reynolds number um, And, and that, I'm not sure quite how to get around that. Um, but I think that's, after looking at these simulations for a long time and thinking about it, that's what I think is going on. And that the alpha and beta that you get from this problem aren't telling us anything in particular. And that at high magnetic Reynolds number, we're always going to be stuck with this problem. And that we're not helped out by, we're not helped out by sheer at either. And, um, I know there were various suggestions for how we get around it. I think Mike himself has a suggestion. He's going to come along with later and tell us how it's all going to work. But at least at this level, it, it doesn't work. And at this level, I, I, I think this is the, is the problem. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you for staying perfectly in time. Let me do small comments. Of course, you observe uh, small scale dynamo. But about large scale dynamo, you should have been nice in your simulation scale separation between uh, energy contained scale of turbulence in this case of kinetic uh, uh, cells and uh, light is, uh, scale of both. If, if it will be rapid peak larger than 5, I should not produce real. No, no, it is. It is. It is. It is. It is larger than 5. Because we have a box. The box size is 10. Mm -hmm. but but that, but because it's rotating quite fast, the, the cell size is less than one. We have of the order of 15 to 20 cells across the box, and we have one mode in the shear. So there is, yeah, there is a scale separation. Maybe not enough. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, in your simulation, uh, there is a generation of small scale dying. So the magnetic particle number in your simulations is uh, five. Is five. Five. Okay. If you take simulations with small magnetic particle number, mm -hmm. so the threshold for excitation of magnetic fluctuations, small scale dynamo, uh, will be high. And so, in that case, it's possible to organize clear experiment where you don't have small scale dynamo, and there can be a possibility for the generation of large scale magnetic field due to the shear. Due to sheer effects. Oh, okay. uh, and for example, yeah. Uh, but you haven't answered to my question. If you compare shear with the correlation time, this parameter is of the order of 1 as multiplied by tau. Okay. Or this is a small parameter or large parameter. Sorry, what, what, what am I comparing to a correlation time? Uh, okay, shear yeah, with the correlation time. Be. Multiplication of shear yeah. by correlation time. So you have strong shear or weak shear in comparison with the characteristic turbulence stuff. Um, so by a, you mean I'm not sure which time I'm comparing to a correlation time. Yeah, okay, I understand. But As you see, comparing a velocity time. to a time. Characteristic right? turbulence time in your simulation. Shear is a gradient of the velocity. Okay, so you want you want u over d or d over u or whichever way around. Against, um, <laughs> <laughs> you are a mess? Yeah. 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 Yes. yes, exactly. Um, exactly. I, don't, I don't know. Um, it's, um, okay, so, so the shear velocity over the RMS velocity is about 50%. Okay. And then you've got um, KF. By KF, you mean the 
Forcing scale. Forcing wave number. Wave number. Okay, and they scale too much. Which is one if you define the box in that way. Your cells are 10 times smaller than the box, so it's one tenth. Okay. That is 50%, so it's like 120. Your omega term is like 1 upon 20. Okay. So this is a small shield. Small shield. Yeah, small shield in comparison with the producer tool. So have you tried to increase shield now? No, no. It can't depend on the size of the box, this parameter. It's the size of the cell. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So the, the fact that it's 10 cells in the box must be irrelevant. No, no, but the absolute value is 1 tenth. Of what? Of k. Okay. Okay. Give it. But why is k a tenth? No, but if, if, if they look bigger, so 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 there so would be a larger number of cells <laughs> than the bigger ones. K yeah, would be. Yeah, okay, but you've still got, you've got half your energy in, in a driven mode with, with, you know, with no tendency whatsoever to buy two. You see, my feeling is that it's easy. I think there's a serious issue that, that mean field theory isn't, isn't really working. I think we're barking up the wrong tree. I don't think alpha and beta, you can calculate them to your heart's content for this problem. They are not going to tell you about how fast something is growing. Okay. And, 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 and you, can, you can always say, ah, but if you did this, but if you did that. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the bottom line is that for this problem, you can go in and you can calculate alpha and you can calculate beta. And if you like mean field theory, that will tell you that something will grow like alpha k minus beta k squared. You will never see it. But here you have non helical turbulence. No, I have helical turbulence. It's helical. Of course, it is helical. That's what the thing was. Helical in the sense that. Uh, helical in the sense that there's lots of helicity. Uh, mean, mean helicity equals zero. Yeah, like it does on the sun. Yeah, this is non helical. No, 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 this is helical. It's Brutonesque, so of course it's anti symmetric. But then the sun has no mean field. It's east west in the north and it's west east in the south. Why are we fast? There's no mean field. <laughs> So, yeah, this is the sun. The top half is the north and the bottom half is the south. Yeah, yeah, the in the north and the south. Yeah, the top so does the sun. Yeah, so, and yeah I'm small, but I'm interested in the thing which is not in the small, uh, small scale. Mm -hmm. We showed that the peak is at some scale. Is that very far from the resistive scale? Or uh, is it yes. the scale of the eddy? Yes, scale of the eddy, more or less. Right. Because this is also another interesting thing with torsion and diamond. Alexia Kushina would be interested in what is the scale of this small scale diagram? Is it correlated on the scale of the eddy or it's correlated yeah, on the no, scale? I think it's correlated on the scale of the eddy. Before you throw away alpha effect, have you tried to compare the alpha effect in the presence of a short form of the rotating problem? No, 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 I haven't actually. No. You think it would be different? Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about something. And you can have the, the, uh, the dynamo, non-robust dynamo, I mean, in your mode, you can have alpha only on the side, and your dynamo goes away, you can make it even more. Oh. Alpha may be the same in the show. But the difficulty is that if it were a large-scale dynamo, it would look like a large-scale dynamo, and it doesn't. I mean, so I don't know if it's weak. However, if there is a certain thing, I mean, it may come from the combination, of course. In order to absorb diamond, we need uh, a nice flux of magnetic fluids. If not, we know that the result will be zero. But is it it's not linear or dynamic? Uh, not linear. linear or non-linear? It's, it's, it's everything. It's solving the full equation. Yeah. It's not linear. So it may be another problem. Yeah. So last no, 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 short question. It is a, okay, sure. Maybe it's not a problem to you guys. It is a problem to me. Because, <laughs> because, because it has everything that everybody holds dear. It has helicity. It's turbulent. Everyone says, blimey, helical turbulence. Yeah, what a great way for a large-scale dynamo to act. And it doesn't work. And you can always say, ah, you've forgotten the cosmic ray flux. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it is, it yeah. is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it's a problem. I'm yeah. glad you guys, it's not a problem. Uh, again, I'm not a numerical guy, but I remember, for example, that Axie had the same problem, 
many years, and after that he separates in a strong state, and he produces diamonds. Okay. Yeah, that's one thing. The other thing, of course, is because it's nonlinear, we do expect catastrophic quenching. Yes. So you need to compare it against what we expect, which is, of course, already catastrophic quenching because you don't have uh, open boundaries. Yeah, and you okay, have a steady state. All right. And I no mean, mean current. But one of those, one of those magnetic spectra was in the kinematic regime. There's no, there is no kinematic dynamo with a sizable large-scale field either. You know. And there's, I mean, there's no alpha effect to quench, so... <laughs> no, no, okay, okay. For the, okay. For the sake of time, it should have this last question. Yes, in your, you are the periodic box, uh, in, uh, 10 by 10, yeah. and you show a uh, spectrum which is maximum at a wave number around 10. And it means that uh, the scale of the excitation, the scale of R, about the, the, the scale of the height of the, of the so I don't see why it's, uh, so you, you you have reached the maximal scale of uh, of, of your computation of your box so I don't understand why uh, you, you you have a large scale dynamo well because the scales the scale separation in this problem is in the horizontal yes, but I, I, oh. so the, if you so what this problem so what this what should happen is if you've got lots of scales in, in, the, uh, in the horizontal direction, yes. then they should combine to form a horizontal field. Yes, that's exactly what the alpha effect, that's exactly what it says for this alpha problem. Alpha effect is not magic, is it? It's, it's, uh... No, it doesn't work, but that's what it should say for this problem. The alpha tensor for this problem is... One naught 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 one in the top left hand corner, and so it generates a magnetic field, which is b x of z, b y of z. But what I, I think is that at the, the time you have your saturation, you have uh, magnetic alpha, which is uh, at uh, kinetic alpha, and even so you. No 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 no! It's not that at all. There is no kinetic alpha. Kinetic alpha just doesn't work. Some of those. Some of those cases, they have a weak field because there's no dimension, so you're not having to find it. You put in a, you can put in a weak field. You can't even generate alpha. It's it's, it's not a non it's not a nonlinear effect. Can, this is just a suggestion or a question. Can we? I suggest for the discussion today, this problem. What are the diagnostics of large-scale dynamo action? Because I think that you are talking about the same thing which Ryan mentioned from that different viewpoint observation that he was showing. I read map of M51 where you can, with naked eye, see the large scale over immediately. So, what you have to do to convince yourself there is no order? Why not discuss it in the evening, after the end of the session? Or the, after the end of the session? Let's thank David again for his... Uh, Dimitri Somonov is talking about low-dimensional models of stellar dynamics. So, uh, why? My aim is, uh, in some sense, uh, opposite to the aim of the previous speaker. I uh, try to explain what uh, we can suggest if uh, we are uh, asking by a practical astronomer to reduce uh, somehow the uh, complication, uh, the complicated uh, dynamo models uh, to something what uh, is uh, accessible for uh, astronomers. Uh, just to be speci specific, I uh, would uh, like to explain why uh, one uh, my uh, discussion with NERMA, which uh, uh, took place uh, uh, a dozen, dozen of years ago, she said, uh, look, uh, there is a well-known uh, butterfly, solar butterfly diagram. We observers uh, believe that uh, uh, there is something like cyclic activity on T-Tauri stars, but we feel that uh, this activity is somehow different uh, from uh, uh, solar activity. Please try us to formulate uh, what uh, are uh, your ideas, uh, how uh, we can distinguish uh, the difference between uh, solar activity and T-Tauri uh, stars activity in observation. Then the uh, 
uh, reasonable following question from my, my side was what do you know about the hydrodynamic of T tower stars, which replace almost nothing. Uh, I, I believe that it is uh, uh, f uh, fully convective stars and not star and nothing more. What, what can, can you suggest in, the, in such situation? And uh, you know, uh, it is out of any sense to develop a detailed uh, model uh, which you possibly can solve in uh, uh, with uh, large computers and so on, just because nothing, almost nothing is known. And uh, if you try to uh, to think uh, how you can uh, uh, resolve this uh, situation, that you know, I cannot uh, just uh, reject the uh, opinion uh, of any er an Erma just because she is now speaker of. Uh, uh, Parliament of Estonia, and uh, uh, we cannot reject the opinions of high-level high politicians without uh, uh, any reason. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, the, uh, the possible solution is, uh, was in my opinion suggested uh, many, year, many years ago, uh, for example, by uh, Rosmakin and Zeltovich, uh, when she uh, suggested to reduce uh, mean field equation for uh, uh, for solar dynamo somehow to a simple uh, uh, low dimensional relatively low dimensional uh, dynamical system. Of course, uh, it is uh, drastical uh, or it, it has to be drastical over oversimplification, but something uh, can uh, can be kept. Then. Uh, Anwar and myself uh, worked uh, on this uh, uh, on this topic uh, quite a lot uh, years ago, but uh, due to various reasons, uh, this work uh, was uh, remains unpublished. But I I, I shall use uh, many ideas de developed uh, this time and uh, old paper of uh, Karl Heinz uh, Redler and uh, Wiedemann. Uh, uh, it appears to be uh, uh, also very instructive in this respect. So the idea uh, is like that. Uh, what is the explan uh, uh, famous part of explanation how the dynamo machine works? So you have a uh, poloidal field and uh, you have differential rotation and uh, you have the toroidal field from pol poloidal field uh, due to uh, different uh, uh, differential rotation because this point and that point are uh, moving with uh, different uh, uh, specific uh, uh, rotation rate. Then let, uh, let us accept that there is something like alpha effect which, what can convert toroidal field into polyidal field. Uh, then uh, you obtain an uh, excitation uh, chain, of, chain of oxidation which can excite you maybe diamond yeah. field, maybe uh, quadruple yeah. field, and so on, it uh, uh, includes poloidal uh, uh, field and uh, toroidal field. The question is how, it, how do you uh, image what does it mean uh, uh, toroidal and poloidal field? And the uh, uh, attractive uh, way is to say uh, if uh, you have no diamond, uh, your magnetic field decays and uh, is, uh, becomes to be similar to uh, uh, a simple combination of leading uh, mode of free decay. Uh, if you uh, start to add uh, magnetic field generators, you obtain something what, is, uh, what can be described as a combination of first uh, decay modes. And uh, your aim is to obtain the uh, uh, coefficient of this uh, more of the, uh, uh, in this uh, linear combination, and then uh, look uh, after uh, what uh, perturbation, what uh, uh, excitation effect uh, becomes sufficient to obtain a growing solution. Uh, this uh, was uh, a way which tried uh, Redner and Wiedemann uh, many years ago, and they uh, uh, demonstrated that. Uh, you, uh, that uh, corresponding uh, series uh, are very, very, uh, are converging very, very uh, slow. You have to, uh, uh, to include 
huge amount of uh, uh, free decay modes to obtain something like a uh, reasonable uh, numerical scheme based on this idea. Our, uh, in fact, uh, the idea was uh, uh, discussed uh, with Anwar uh, uh, in, uh, many years ago, uh, is that uh, uh, this uh, basis contains uh, many uh, functions which really don't participate in the excitation process and many connections between functions which uh, plays no, uh, no important role in the generation. And then uh, now we, uh, we uh, performed corresponding analysis for, uh, uh, for uh, the problem uh, for uh, mean field problem uh, for fully convective stars and for uh, initial uh, Parker uh, model for uh, uh, for uh, uh, seen uh, rotating uh, shell with uh, alpha effect. So how we did? We uh, took uh, uh, Moffat's bo uh, mo uh, book of Moffat. Uh, read uh, what, is the, uh, what are the spectra of uh, free decay modes and then uh, took uh, basic decay mode we, uh, which uh, uh, has the uh, lowest uh, decay rate then the following one uh, uh, following one and then so on and, uh, and uh, took uh, such uh, simple uh, it took the combination, uh, linear combinations of such uh, decay mode and, uh, and, uh, are gonna, and uh, write down the projections of mid-field equation of such uh, uh, finite dimensional basis. Uh, it is uh, quite straightforward but uh, to, uh, takes uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, time just for uh, uh, to calculate matrix uh, corresponding ma matrix elements and uh, as a result, you obtain uh, 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 at the first stage uh, uh, a, a problem for uh, two uh, arbitrary coefficients, for three, and so on. And uh, then we enlarge uh, the number of, uh, of uh, decay modes until we obtain excitation of uh, uh, something what uh, grows with oscillation. In practice, it uh, required one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight modes. Until uh, you obtain, uh, you include into the uh, into the uh, pro, uh, uh, problem uh, less than eight uh, modes, you don't obtain uh, a. a uh, 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 correct uh, uh, behavior of uh, such a combination. Uh, uh, something which uh, excites with, uh, uh, with oscillations. Uh, it, uh, uh, is it axisymmetric mode? Yes, yes, there are uh, ju just for the sake of simplicity we work with uh, dipole uh, configuration, dipole symmetry and uh, axisymmetric uh, modes. We took, uh, ju just to develop the method, we took a very simple rotation curve where rotation uh, depends on uh, radius only. It is no problem to, uh, no problem in principle to develop it for uh, quadrupole symmetry, include non axisymmetric modes, take uh, a more realistic rotation curve and uh, things like that. Uh, but uh, we uh, restrict ourselves by this, by this simple uh, question. If we uh, perform the same for, uh, for uh, in, uh, initial Parker dynamo model, uh, we need one, two, three, four, five modes only, and the choice of the modes are, uh, different, uh, are different in both cases. Excuse me, but R omega, it, it doesn't mean dynamo number? Uh, here, uh, uh, here uh, we, uh, we, uh, have to, uh, we have two parameters, uh, alpha and omega, we have R alpha and R omega. Uh, just to be specific, we fix uh, R alpha and vary uh, R omega. It is ju just, just for illustrative 
reasons, of course, we produced uh, quite a lot of such uh, plots. Uh, I, uh, I present uh, two plots only, uh, just to be specific. And we, uh, we uh, performed quite a lot of corresponding experiments to demonstrate that the, uh, the result is uh, stable. The result is stable. So, uh, just uh, uh, one, one uh, conclusion. If we take uh, uh, basic uh, toroi uh, toroidal mode and basic poloidal mode, uh, machine do doesn't work. So, in this sense, in this sense, uh, the explanation why uh, 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 Parker machine, uh, Parker Dino machine works, uh, if you uh, understand, if you describe it as uh, one toroidal mode convert into one poloidal mode, and vice versa, it is erroneous explanation. Uh, in such a way, the machine doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You need uh, uh, as much uh, as more. Then, uh, uh, as, uh, so, uh, at least such a choice of modes. Then, uh, uh, by, by the way, this, uh, uh, here, the, uh, 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 the corresponding dynamo number is about uh, uh, 550, uh, 5,500, uh, 5, it is almost what uh, people obtain in uh, uh, detailed uh, simulations of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, dynamos for fully convective uh, spheres. And uh, so, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, one have to have uh, quite a lot of bifurcations until uh, you obtain an uh, exciting uh, mode. So uh, the machine is uh, quite complicated and until you, uh, uh, until you don't uh, have, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, until you don't include uh, uh, a lot of modes into the game, uh, machine uh, don't want to work. Uh, well, uh, then uh, we uh, composed uh, 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 we composed a, uh, uh, a figure which demonstrated the makeup of uh, the uh, uh, growing uh, mode. And uh, here uh, you see that uh, several modes, uh, several uh, modes. Uh, give a uh, reasonable contribution in the growing solution. I, I shall not go into details, but uh, of course uh, you, you, see, uh, you see that of course such plot can be produced. Then uh, we uh, make the following analysis. We look which modes can be excluded from the uh, model without uh, violation of uh, main shape of the uh, result. Uh, no, uh, we just uh, took uh, one arbitrary mode and, say, and look uh, whether uh, this uh, plot uh, changes or, or not. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and then uh, we analyzed uh, the uh, connections in the scheme. Uh, what uh, what, uh, what uh, links uh, link uh, based on differential rotation or uh, on uh, uh, alpha effect can be excluded. And uh, as a result, we obtain such a scheme. For a fully convective stars, we need uh, such mode, first uh, poloidal mode, first uh, toroidal mode, second poloidal mode, and so on. And the uh, links between them uh, shown here. Uh, one type of links are based on alpha effect and uh, the, uh, uh, shown by uh, dashed line and uh, shown uh, a link uh, shown by, uh, by uh, solid line uh, is a link based on uh, differential rotation. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, corresponding cartoon for classical Parker Dynamo uh, is quite different from that one. So, uh, yes, uh, yes uh, and, and, uh, suppose uh, we, we do see that uh, uh, two machines are working uh, Differently, differently, and uh, uh, these two cartoons uh, illustrate what are uh, what, what is the difference between uh, these two machines. Then uh, we composed uh, butterfly diagrams uh, obtained uh, on uh, 
basic on such uh, schemes. This, uh, the, that is a uh, classical uh, butterfly diagram of Parker migratory dynamo, of course, uh, it, uh, which in this butterfly diagram is obtained in, uh, in this very approximation. It is no problem to solve uh, the full equation of Parker model, but uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, make uh, present a butterfly diagram, but here we obtain it in the framework of uh, of our uh, model. And what is the, uh, what, what uh, do you see on this butterfly diagram? You have two, uh, two toroidal modes underlying uh, this butterfly, this uh, model. One is concentrated here, uh, and uh, the other is uh, concentrating there. Uh, and uh, the uh, underlying uh, physics in, uh, in propagation of these activity modes in, uh, is that uh, First, uh, this uh, mode uh, is uh, dominating uh, at the beginning of the cycle, and this mode is dominating on the end of the cycle. Then you open a book of Vitinsky and, and uh, can read that Vitinsky uh, argued that uh, this is a phenomenology of uh, distribution of solar magnetic uh, fields, uh, uh, and, uh, and he claimed, claimed that uh, he uh, is able to distinguish between uh, sunspots responsible for this area and uh, this area of the butterfly diagram, that these sunspots are uh, morphologically different. I, uh, I uh, uh, am not uh, clever enough to uh, uh, verify this uh, opinion of Vitinsky, but Vitinsky was an uh, expert, in, uh, uh, prominent expert in uh, uh, sunspots and uh, we can, uh, how to say, accept his uh, opinion. Uh, what is the uh, situation on, uh, for uh, the uh, fully convective star? Both modes uh, are, uh, uh, are located in one, uh, uh, in one domain. And so instead of uh, migration, you, uh, you obtain a, a toroidal field distribution which uh, who uh, develops and decays, develops and decays, and uh, no propagation of dynamo wave. If you uh, include uh, uh, following uh, uh, members of uh, uh, this decay, uh, this, time, uh, this series, of course you obtain uh, small uh, migrations. So it is not, uh, uh, not a completely static wave, but uh, uh, with some, uh, some migrations. I, uh, uh, I uh, stress that uh, we took uh, more or less arbitrary rotation curve and I uh, don't insist, of course, that uh, it is a ge generic uh, uh, property which uh, survives for more uh, realistic rotation curve, but at least it is something to be suggested for observer uh, uh, as a, uh, some starting uh, so, uh, starting idea to uh, compare uh, observations with, uh, uh, with the series. Then, uh, of course, uh, we exploited this idea uh, for uh, nonlinear uh, dynamo models. Pre uh, what uh, pre uh, I have shown previously, it was a uh, uh, linear dynamo model. This, uh, then uh, it is possible to uh, project uh, in uh, nonlinear non term. We took a uh, uh, very simple uh, alpha quenching, algebraic alpha quenching. Of course, you, you can uh, take whatever, uh, whatever you want, uh, uh, differential equation for alpha or uh, uh, whatever else, and obtain uh, such uh, quite complicated and ugly uh, dynamical system. I, I don't invite you to uh, read it uh, in details, but it, uh, it is what follow from, uh, from the uh, equation in this uh, approximation. It is much more complicated than the dynamical system uh, which uh, considered by uh, Zildovich and, and Rusmakin, but uh, that was uh, something suggested from uh, uh, just from, uh, how to say, uh, uh, writing uh, from your uh, from your head, uh, and uh, here it is somehow taken from 
from the equation. And uh, we, uh, we looked uh, what are uh, the uh, solutions which uh, one can obtain in such a, uh, in such a model. So uh, development of oscillation and then uh, steady oscillation. One possibility it depends on the, uh, you obtain various uh, solutions after the uh, playing of uh, uh, parameters. Uh, uh, dynamo outputs, so uh, uh, almost zero, then uh, uh, excitation of impulses of uh, toroidal field. Uh, then uh, chaotic, uh, uh, chaotic, uh, oscillations, chaotic oscillations. Uh, another possibility. Thank you again. And Manfred, 
quicker, we'll talk about magnetic field generation and low mass stars. Yes, uh, everybody knows about uh, the magnetic field of the sun and solar dynamos, of course. Uh, now, uh, the sun has an outer convection zone and the radiative core. Uh, and that is what actually a lot of many simple stars have. But there is a lower mass, mass threshold for the uh, uh, presence of outer convection zones, or more precisely for uh, the presence of the core. And uh, at least due to stellar structure and evolution theory, uh, main sequence stars with mass below 0.3 solar masses don't have a uh, core anymore. They're fully convective. And now uh, the question is, what does that mean for magnetic field generation and uh, for the magnetic field of these stars? Do we, uh, what concepts of the solar dynamo do still work and uh, which don't? Okay, I'll start with this. Everybody knows this, of course, that uh, the sun <coughs> solar activity follows the 11 or 22 year cycle with field reversals every 11 years and with, um, yeah, with this butterfly diagram, which uh, indicates the migration of the active latitudes and uh, <coughs> also with some not very well explained uh, long term modulation. Now, the two most uh, popular explanations for that basically are an alpha omega dynamo or more recently this advection dominated dynamo which is a modified uh, alpha omega dynamo where the meridional flow uh, plays an important uh, part. And uh, very important in all these uh, models is of course the differential rotation uh, which generates a strong toroidal field. Now, the internal rotation of the Sun looks like this. This is a, a representation from video seismology, where color indicates uh, rotation frequency. We basically have uh, fast rotation at the equator, slow rotation at the poles. Uh, that pattern persists throughout the convection zone and disappears at the bottom. Uh, one can parameterize this like this, in which case one gets a percentage of the equatorial uh, rotation period or what the observers like is this, the so-called lapping time, which is something like 100 uh, days for the sun. Uh, surface meridional flow looks like this. Uh, observations don't quite agree about uh, the amplitude, but it's roughly like something like this, 20 meters per second, something like that. Now, at the bottom of the convection zone, we have uh, the so-called Taco Klein which is a relatively thin uh, layer where the uh, differential rotation basically changes. So it, uh, we have a transition from uh, surface rotation to rigid rotation in the core. And that, of course, is a, is a layer which uh, can generate, or the radial shear there can generate strong toroidal fields, uh, which is, of course, important for an alpha omega dynamo. And that's one reason why this why it has been proposed that this is the layer where the dynamo works in the sun. Another is, uh, of course, the issue of uh, flux storage. Uh, but the problem, of course, oh, I don't want to go into all the problems of the solar dynamo, but uh, anyway, uh, this plays some, some part in the discussion of the solar dynamo and the theories of the solar dynamo. Uh, but of course, for fully convective dynamos, this uh, doesn't exist anymore. So if this uh, layer really has a strong effect on, on the dynamo, then this, this should vanish at, at some point, at, at the point where this, uh, where this transition to fully conduct, uh, full conduction uh, starts, uh, we should see some change. And basically, fully conductive stars should behave different from, from the sun, from solar type stars. Now, if we attack this theoretically, um, we use coming from Potsdam, I use uh, mean field theory. Uh, so, mean field uh, equations are probably well known by everybody here. You use some uh, averaging procedure and then add, end up with this electron motive force, which uh, well, the action of the small scales are hidden basically. Uh, field generating effect is the alpha effect, as is well known. 
uh, alpha effect from density stratification, as in the paper from uh, for instance, looks like this. So you've got this, this tensor structure which involves basically rotation and stratification yeah, in a strongly stratified medium here. Uh, now the uh, uh, predictions of, of uh, the so-called second order correlation approximation, which is a uh, very often used uh, approximation in this framework, uh, predicts an alpha that's for fast rotation basically like this. Namely, it's, it's strongly anisotropic and uh, we basically don't have any alpha action in the z-direction, uh, which has some um, which has some uh, effect on uh, dynamos uh, based on uh, basically on, uh, on this alpha effect. So to study the whole thing, uh, we make a simple numerical model. Uh, it's 3D, find uh, a difference code, and it's uh, cylindrical coordinates for technical reasons. And so the setup basically is a cylindrical box with the star inside. It's contained in some uh, Conducting medium, yes? Z direction is the direction of rotation, am I right? Pardon? Z direction in your calculation, direction of rotation. Uh, in, in this representation, yes, it was. Yeah, it was cylindrical coordinates in Z, yeah. Not stratification, no, no. Yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, so the star is has a cylindrical box uh, surrounded by. Uh, <coughs> Fully conducting medium, that's of course what one always has to do uh, with this kind of setup. One has to do make some approximations about the surrounding medium uh, to get close to uh, vacuum boundary conditions directly on the stellar surface. One has to make this basically as large as possible, but of course one can uh, try for technical reasons smaller values also. Uh, yeah, so the star is, is fully convective, or can have an outer convection zone with a, with a radiative core, depends on what stellar model you put in there. Uh, then you to, uh, put in alpha effect and diffusion from the second order correlation approximation. Uh, differential rotation, or not, can vary. Uh, yeah, the radiative core is, uh, if present, it's passive, just diffusion. Uh, so the simplest setup, of course, is an alpha square dynamo. We assume there's no differential rotation for some reason. And that's known basically to produce this. If one takes this electromotive force from the second order correlation approximation uh, with this alpha tensor that has no ZZ component, then one basically gets, uh, usually gets the S1. Oops.